everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM, Wickham Sound. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford in the Ilk Shed for a weekly album review. And we play local, unsigned and or independent music. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. You can email me here at the studio by dropping me in a line on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D A N E dot C O B A I N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anybody with MP3s, a story to share, etc. Don't hesitate to get in touch. We're also repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcast. So we are going to go straight over to the Rye Light Zone. And uh, this week we are continuing formally the rise and fall of a social network. This is a novel by myself, Dane Cobain. It's available on Amazon and other bookstores in ebook, audiobook, and paperback formats. We've been serializing it in recent weeks, so if you've missed part of it, feel free to catch up on uh, the players. Formally, the rise and fall of a social network. Chapter 16. The sun was setting in California as we disembarked the aeroplane and headed through the terminus. I could already feel the difference, a subtle change in the atmosphere and a total change of temperature, along with a slight sweetness to the air that spoke of a completely different ecosystem. The two founders pulled out all the stops for our arrival. A minibus showed up to collect our baggage, but we were bundled into the backs of limousines. John helped himself to a bottle of bubbly from the minibar, which he cracked open and poured into flutes. Then Kerry made the mistake of switching on the TV, and John's mood went downhill immediately. Local news channels were reporting on our arrival, recycling a grainy shot of the team as we walked across the precinct of San Jose International Airport. Formerly is a British success story, the reporter was saying. I doubt he'd even heard of us before we showed up at the airport. Shaking off controversy, they've made the journey across the Atlantic to become the latest startup to call Palo Alto home. Early reports suggest. Turn that rubbish off, John bellowed. Kerry was so stunned by the sudden outburst that he dropped the remote, and I had to pick it up and do the job for him. They're after our blood already, and we've only just landed. How did they even know we were here? One of the juniors asked, staring in awe at the screen. Do you think they have someone on the inside? Why? John scowled. Have you got something you want to tell us? Besides, it's not like we're coming here in secret. Sure, we might not be making a song and dance about it, but it's all over the internet if you know where to look. Let's just keep our heads down until we make it to the compound, okay? Now pass me another bottle. We're supposed to be celebrating. The paparazzi greeted us at the gates to Formerly's new office, but John and Peter were well prepared. When John called it a compound, he hadn't been joking. We passed through two security checkpoints that were patrolled by butch-looking Americans with a motley assortment of crew cuts, tattoos and piercings. The outer perimeter surrounded the car park, and the press had slipped through it with the persistence and inevitable momentum of waves crashing against the shore. The second perimeter was a different matter entirely. Even to my untrained eye, it was clearly a newer addition, an eight-foot electric fence with barbed wire and anti-vandal paint. The cast iron gates looked solid and imposing, and they swung open electronically when the driver of the limo wound down the window and flashed his ID at the scanner. A half dozen opportunistic journos tried to squeeze through with a limo, only to be pushed back by a couple of security guards with fierce-looking Alsatians whose job was to patrol the fence's perimeter and to scare the crap out of anyone who tried to get through. I raised an eyebrow at John and he laughed. What? He said. You can't blame us for being security conscious, especially after what that cop said back at the airport. Ah, America. The best place in the world to start your own army without breaking the law. And who's paying for all of this? Our investors, John replied. And eventually, our users. The driver parked the limo right outside the building, and the formerly team stepped unsteadily out onto the warm Californian asphalt. Dusk had settled in and night was on its way but the air was disconcertingly warm and the humidity left us clawing at our collars. I never liked wearing shorts, but I soon got used to it in Palo Alto. None of us knew what to expect from the office, but the outside made me think of a concentration camp. That couldn't have been further from the truth. It was a paradise, a playground for grown-ups and the perfect place to live, work and play. I suspected it was all part of the plan. The drab exterior and the comfortable interior made sure that no one would ever want to leave. Even from just inside the entrance, we got a good view of the place. Desks made from Lego blocks were scattered across the floor, separated by pool tables and a jukebox. I could even see an electric guitar and an amplifier, despite the fact that none of us could play. The walls and ceilings were painted in garish colours that reflected the light from the huge chandeliers and the wide bay windows. In their typically idiosyncratic style, the founders had thought about transportation too. Peter rolled up to greet us on the back of a Segway. What up, guys? he said, 
and welcome to formerly Palo Alto. Come on, let me show you to your rooms. We followed Peter as he led us through the office, weaving in and out of the desks on his Segway until we reached a large set of double doors, right beside a breakout area with a couple of sofas, a television and a games console. This is the kitchen, he announced, hopping off the Segway and leaning it against the wall. Help yourselves to anything you find in here. It's all paid for by the company. As he spoke, he pushed open the doors and led the way into a large, freshly fitted kitchen. Peter smiled at our awestruck expressions and began to wander around the room, opening cupboards at random to show off the produce and equipment inside them. Of course, he continued, you're free to get your own food too. Just make sure you initial it so that the rest of us know not to eat it. If you've got any requests, then send them through to Pam. She's our new office manager and she'll be keeping us stocked up. And what about the cleaning? asked Kerry. Someone's got to do it. Don't worry, Peter replied. We've got a cleaner, a guy called Nate. You'll get to meet him at some point. He's coming round twice a week to handle the communal areas, so you only need to worry about your rooms. Speaking of which, let's go. The tour's not over yet, folks. Peter continued to lead the way with John a couple of steps behind him. A rear entrance to the kitchen led into a bizarre internal garden, which was surrounded by the walls of the complex. The building looked like a donut from the air, a donut surrounded by the fence of death. The halls are just through here, said Peter, leading the way along a walkway. And don't forget, we've also got a gymnasium and a common room with an HD TV where Kerry can show off his movies. Woohoo! He cheered. It's about damn time. Quite, said John. But it's for work as well as play, so don't get carried away. We've got a job to do, after all. Peter continued to lead the way back into the complex and up a narrow flight of stairs. It reminded me of being back at university, only the rooms were smaller and the office was our common room. Without our belongings, the rooms looked bare and empty, but I guessed that they looked comfortable enough in time. Besides, it wasn't like we'd spend much time in them, other than when we were sleeping. So that's it, folks, said John, taking over the role as our tour guide. We'll go grab a cup of tea and figure out who's staying where, and then we'll hand over your keys. Any questions? Yeah, Kerry said. I have a question. Where do you guys keep the beer? That was the latest excerpt of Formerly the Rise and Fall of a Social Network by myself, Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is Jazz DeLorean with Rain on a Sunday. Oh, there. 
There's nothing like rain on a Sunday Daddy by Big Nose Thomas and before that we had Rain on a Sunday by Jazz DeLorean. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host Dane Cobain and it's time for us now to be joined by this week's guest who is Big Nose Thomas himself. So the first question is one that I ask everybody which is what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Last book I read? Uh, It was called Dead in Dartmoor. Uh, The name of the author escapes me but it was good. I enjoyed it. Cool. Is, is that um, like a crime novel? It's a yeah, it's a crime one. There's uh, the I'm uh, I live in Aylesbury, mm-hmm. so my the library in Aylesbury it's sort of it's, it's basically just crime books. So mm-hmm. I'm working my way down. I'm starting at I'm starting at the A's and just working my way down. 
Cool. That way. Awesome. Cool. And so obviously today I want to chat to you mostly about music. Um, so I thought yes. sort of a good place to start would be to ask how long you've been making music and how you got your start. Well, uh, I started playing guitar when I was 13, but I started performing maybe when I was about, about mm, 19, 20, I think. Um, so the, the first couple, the first couple of years when I was playing guitar, I was, I liked the idea of being a guitarist, but I wasn't interested in practicing, yeah. shall we say. Um, and then I, uh, I started listening to older music. I kind of got into guitar through Guitar Hero mm -hmm. and that got me into rock and things like that. And I liked rock music. Um, but then I got into the sixties stuff like Beatles yeah. and then that took me back to Eric Clapton. And then uh, all these names started popping. I got obsessed with Eric Clapton, and all these names started popping up in his interviews about Big Bill Brunzi, Blind Willie McTell, Muddy Waters, mm. all these amazing guys. Uh, and then I just started sort of discovering, I think I discovered blues maybe about, when I was about 16. Um, so I'm 26 now, so that's 10 years of just, yeah. I, just, I was just obsessed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, enough. Cool. Um, and you know, you you sort of mentioned guitar, and I'm guessing like guitar is your main instrument, but you're a multi instrumentalist, right? So, what are some of the other instruments that you can play? Well, I play piano and harmonica. They're probably the two. I play this in. The, I like jug band music, which mm -hmm. is from music from the twenties, and they were playing homemade instruments like jugs and washboards yeah. and things like that. So, I can turn my hand to that stuff, and I can play mandolin as well but i'd say guitar piano and harmonica are the the main ones cool and and like in on the subject of instruments if you could learn to play any new instrument that you can't play now uh which would you pick and why um uh probably the clarinet always loved the sound of the clarinet one of my favorite musicians is a guy called Pee Wee russell and he's just got this beautiful sweet tone um and i yeah i was i was always fond of the clarinet but uh i don't have any inspiration <laughs> i don't have uh, aspirations to learn any instruments three's enough yeah yeah well and also again going back to going back to blues i mean it's like all you really need is a you know a, a guitar and, and a voice really maybe like a stomp box or something like that right um, exactly yeah. and and what is it about blues that like draws you to it do you think I don't know. I think that's the reason why. I can't <laughs> put my finger on one particular thing about it. It's just, uh, it, it, it just to me, it's so it's such interesting music. It's it's got um, so many different qualities, and it's it's from you you learn about different cultures. It's mm -hmm. about the the fight between man and woman, and. It's all these other things like the evolution of the recording industry and things like that. That all goes hand in hand with blues. And it's, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't put one thing about why I like it, but probably, I'd probably say the sound. I just like the, yeah. the sound of old blues music to me is, um, it, 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 it's unbeatable. Yeah. Well, and I suppose as well, like, because blues kind of, blues kind of, like rock and roll kind of grew out of blues and then like pop kind of grew out of rock and roll as well so blues is almost like the foundation of, of you know most modern music i guess yeah exactly and the, a lot of it well when blues was uh, my favorite era of it is the, the 20s and at that point it was more it was a style of song rather than a genre mm. it was only later on that it sort of became a, a genre so it was all I just like that old style of music. As I said, I, I put it in as blues, but it, it's just anything from the twenties. You know, even the pop stuff, the schmaltzy, you know, ballady stuff from the twenties. I just love. Yeah, and I mean, I think I saw on your website. Don't you, didn't you describe it as like vaudeville blues? Yeah, vaudeville blues. That's right. So it the vaudeville blues. It it's sometimes called classic blues. But it's vaudeville blues was primarily. If you listen to it now, you probably say it was more jazzy than yeah. bluesy. But I hate using those terms. 
But uh, it was mostly about, you usually had, uh, it was a, usually a female singer and it had some, this had some sort of jazz band backing them. Um, and the, the style of songs, they were a little more intricate. There was, it wasn't just straight 12 bars. There were a lot of 12 bars. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of 16 bars, 24 bars. It was almost, they almost played pop music as well. That old sort of Tim Pan Alley, Tim Pan Alley style of music. Yeah. And heavily influenced by ragtime as well. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So, I mean, I was going to ask you how you would de define your sound. I mean, do you think you could have a stab at it? I guess it's, again, blues inspired, but I, I, I get um, the sense you don't like you don't like to sort of pigeonhole the genres as well. Um, I think, well, I think it's quite hard to, the, the 20s and the 30s, there was such a, it was such blurred lines between what's blues and what's mm. jazz. And it's, it's kind of hard to say that it's just blues, but the of the of the stuff that I love, it's always it's always been blues. My favorite singer is actually Al Jolson. Mm -hmm. the, the the he's billed as the world's greatest entertainer. Um, but he took a lot from the uh, black musicians of the wherever he would hear them. Yeah, and he had a lot of blueness to his voice as well. Um, I would probably I'd probably put it as vaudeville blues. That that's that's probably what I'm most comfortable with. Yeah, cool. And you, you mentioned a few of them, but who, who would you say the, act, the acts are who have been the biggest influence maybe on, on your guitar playing, your vocals, and, and your songwriting in general? Oh, well, um, well, Al Jolson, for one, uh, and uh, a chap called Papa Charlie Jackson, who was, uh, he played a six-string banjo. Cool. And he was one of the first to... We were one of the first male blues performers to be recorded and to write his own songs. And um, I just find his record so compelling to listen to. I, always, I can always go back to them as well. That's that's the thing I really like. You know the words, you know what's coming, but it, you can yeah, you can always go back to them. Um, Tampa Red as well, Hudson Whitaker, who was a uh, he was a bottleneck player. He was very popular he recorded over i think he recorded into started in the 20s recorded up until the 50s mm. and uh his bottleneck playing and singing is just it comes straight from that school of vaudeville blues and that's what that's what i love yeah but then of course on top of that i also like the chicago but any blues from any blues up until about the 1970s i just love so the chicago names like well, I mean, Little Walter and Sonny Boy Williamson, the first. Uh, for guitar, probably T Bone Walker as well. Lonnie Johnson as well. There's there's so many. There's so yeah. many. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Big Nose Thomas, and this is Big Nose Thomas with Leave the Third Gal Alone. <laughs> Your wife 
There's only love in our hands for you Your sweetheart will be crazy for all that you do The third one's got blades for hands and a fork for a tongue You call her yours, your death is soon to come So if you've got a wife and a sweetheart too You better leave that third gal alone There's no telling what they might do What damage on you might be sprung But there was a gal called Green. She was the kindest gal I had ever seen She went with a man called Piggly Bill And though he only had one leg, she loved him still She met his wife, which she didn't mind But when she met his outside woman, she wasn't so kind She burst down the boar, sliced them both limb from limb And then put them in his bed and slipped poison in his gin So if you've got a wife and a sweetheart too You better leave that bad gal alone That was Leave the Third Gal Alone by Big Nose Thomas. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. And it's time for us now to be rejoined by Big Nose Thomas for this week's interview. And um, so you, you uh, do you play covers or do you play like just covers, just originals or a mixture of both? Um, you know, what kind of music do you play? It's a mixture of both. But my original songs are all inspired by, you know, this era. Yeah. So I write them in that style, but try and try and add my own words to it and things. And um, I, uh, I, I just, I think I developed such a connection for this music. I just wanted it to be as authentic as possible to myself. Now you can hear that I'm not a, a black American from the south. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, I could try and sing in a Scottish accent because it does work. You know, you've you've seen. Like the proclaimers and mm. those Paolo Nettini, I always get compared to him. <laughs> oh, sorry, Paolo. Um, there's, a, there's a songwriter I love called Malcolm Middleton. Who, he was one half of Arab Strap, and he sings his. Uh, he's like acoustic singer songwritery stuff, but he sings in a Scottish accent as well, and it works really well. But it's impossible oh, really? for impossible for me to cover any of his songs. Sound wrong if I sing it in my accent. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And the thing as well is that the Scottish accent it lends itself. It's quite. It's quite harsh as well, so it lends itself quite well to blues. It works yeah. works quite well. Cool, awesome. And when you like when you write music, how do you approach that? Do you like start with lyrics? Do you start with an idea? Do you start noodling on guitar? What What does it normally look like for you? Well, it, it usually starts with me um, listening to something and sort of getting inspiration from that. Yeah. I mean, much like yourself. I mean, you're a you're a writer, right? So. Mm-hmm. I think you need to you need to for a musician you need to listen to or more so than you actually play. Yeah. As if with writing you need to read as much as yeah. you and things like that. Yeah, and if you're a painter you need to look at other people's paintings. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, I think it sometimes sometimes it pops in like um, there's some great there's great songs with amazing titles that that really sort of inspire words like uh, uh, I remember one title from Al Jolson which is a song I do it's called Weird and Robinson Crucial Go with Friday on Saturday Night <laughs> I think that's so, so sometimes it happens like that titles come to me like that and I write a song around that or sometimes it's just it's usually something to do with a lyric or uh, a title or something rather than musically based yeah and is it ever difficult for you? Because you mentioned again trying to stay true to yourself, but also sort of staying true to that sort of vaudeville style. I mean, obviously our lives are very different in the twenty twenties to, to people's lives in the nineteen twenties. Um, you right. know, does that ever cause problems with like writing lyrics and things like that? Because like you know, you have attempted to write about I don't know a smartphone or something like that, and you're like, well, no, that wouldn't that would clash with it. Or yeah, well, I am. Um... I think I've done it for long enough that I have a I'll have an instinct for it, and I think I think wow that sounds a bit that doesn't work. Or yeah. I'm uh, I mean I'm very old fashioned as well. I'm not one for <laughs> technology and everything like that. So uh, there's I, I like I, like I said I think I've I think I've got a filter. I've developed a filter for what would work and what doesn't work because. Yeah. 
some people tr some people try and go contemporary and, and make it about things like that you know facebook blues yeah. and things like that for me that doesn't work for other people it might work but, but I, it doesn't work for me yeah cool awesome and in terms of like recording how, how do you record your music well i uh i was playing at the bletchley blues club supporting a, a blues rock guitarist called chrissy matthews and he was playing with a trio and his bassist uh we got talking and he said he wanted to because i play with just the i just play with one mic that picks up the guitar and the sound he was uh he was very interested in recording that way so we just got talking and uh I uh, I went over to his studio in Oxfordshire. It's called Forge Studios, and it's a beautiful out in the countryside, beautiful cottage. Uh, he's got a it's a it's a small room, granted, but he's got a great setup. And because it's it's only one mic, um, all that was really required was just to find the sweet spot in the room mm. and then just chuck out as many songs as we can. And, I've got a, a fair amount of songs, so I think we did. I I only did those recordings I sent you. We did that. Uh, it was one day, and I think we got about a good twenty-five to thirty done. Cool, awesome, and and I guess as well that kind of again is a throwback to how things were recorded back in the day as well, before like digital studios and auto tune and all of this stuff. So again, it kind of works well with the kind of music you're making. Right, exactly. And that, that was the whole appeal. That's what I love about it as well, is that it's there's no there's no hiding place for it. Mm. You have to be able to play your instrument, you have to know what you're doing and yes, if you make a mistake, it's it's there. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And um, I mean I was gonna ask what equipment you use, so I guess it's pretty much just you and your guitar, right? I pretty much it's uh, me and uh, uh, a resonator. Nice. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the resonator guitars. Yeah, I am. I think actually, I think I'm pretty sure I've seen some posts from you on Facebook, maybe. With, of That's the resonator. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a metal body guitar. It was, it was very it was popular in the twenties, uh, and they're they're a bit louder than acoustic guitars. Mm -hmm. So that affords me because I sing quite loudly. So that affords me a bit a better balance so to speak yeah and it's great for busking as well yeah cool awesome and like mentioning busking so do you, do you busk off do you busk often and if so like where where are some of your favorite spots i try to um it's it's, it's very weather dependent at the minute mm. um it's usually just the, it's usually just at the top of the high street in Aylesbury. yeah that's where I've, that's where i bust um trying to frequent a couple of open mics a week and things like that. Yeah. Just keep them playing and, and whatnot. Yeah. And cause I was going to ask you about like playing live. So, I mean, do you do gigs or is it mainly open mics and what, what's some of the ones you go to some of your favorite venues? Well, I've started, I only really, I moved down to Aylesbury to, to play with my friend uh, and we were going to do some Chicago blues stuff as a duo, but he had another band at the time and he he was a bit more interested in that, and mm. so I, I decided to go solo, uh, and that was about in July. So I've had I've had a couple of gigs here and there, but just trying to get contacts and and things like that. And uh, I, uh, I I some I usually play at the Aristocrat Open Mic in Aylesbury. Uh, there's also a great venue called the Petri Dish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, been there and oh you've been yeah you? it's nice yeah yeah a nice place um and there's a couple other pubs around yeah as well cool um so i've only got a few more questions left one of them i wanted to know so where does the name big nose thomas come from well i mean you can you can you can see my uh my picture there now and i don't have a small schnauzer by any means um i i think it's just it, it, for partly, a lot of these guys back in the 20s and 30s on records, they had these great names like mm. Spark Plug Smith and yeah. Papa Edgell and God, there's, there's a whole host of names. Um, and I, I, I think it just, for me, if I just said my own name, if it was just a, on a, um, 
a, on a poster or something, yeah. I'd sort of go, you know, I wouldn't be bothered with that. But if I see a name Big Nose Thomas, certainly from a personal perspective, I've got, oh, that's yeah. interesting. And particularly if they know that I'm playing vaudeville blues as well, they think, right, yeah. that's going to, that's going to, yeah, well, uh, trigger and, a few interests. And I think it goes, again, it goes with the, the genre, like you're saying, like it is kind of, every, a lot of blues musicians have their like blues musician names. It's a bit like being being a rapper. Like if you're a rapper, you have to have a rapper name. It's just what everybody does. And it, it's right. so much it weird if you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And I wanted to ask you, so uh, you mentioned obviously you're from Fife. Uh, do, do, you mm. think, do you think that affects your sound at all? Um, well, certainly the accent, I think, uh, is, is, is a USP. Mm. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's another, it's another um, thing. You know, I'm not American. I'm not black. I'm not from the South. You know, I'm yeah. white, Scottish, and living in the 21st century. So, um, I, it, just, it just makes it a bit more unique, I suppose. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, so the last question is, is technically two, but so what have you got planned next and where can people follow you to stay updated and to find out more? Well, I have a gig at the Bletchley Blues Club in December. I'm, well, I'm actually, I'm playing with some guys up in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. uh, guys I used to play with up in Glasgow at the end of November. Uh, and we'll be recording some stuff. If you want to see that, you could go on uh, Richard Rins' channel, Richard W. Rins' uh, YouTube channel. There's a whole load of clips, a whole load of songs we've done, uh, and we'll be recording some more when I'm when I'm up there back in November. Uh, and then I have a, a gig at the Bletchley Blues Club supporting the um, excellent Chinelli Brothers. I believe that's the. I don't know what the date is actually, but. It's it's early December. Um, yeah. And if, you, if you're interested in what I do, I've got a Facebook page. It's Big Nose Thomas. And uh, I try and post it. Like I said, I'm not a technology person by any means. Not a social media, not a Facebooker. But uh, I've been trying to try and keep it consistent. Every three or four days or something, put something up there. Big thank you to Big Nose Thomas for joining me. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Big Nose Thomas with Pedal Blues. How often do you hear a pedal or brave in the deep dark sea? Pedal or brave in the deep dark sea. Well, that's as common to find as a woman that doesn't pine over me. Well, be soft and harmless, it makes for the perfect disguise. Petition in their husband's eyes. I've got a week in a way that puts out the women's shame. I've got a week in a way that puts out the women's shame. I'm no handyman, darling. Where they may be sleeping with their men, but it's me running round their head. But you can see I'm through all the powers out of my steel. Stay.
where the man you've gone. But I say time and time again, darling, stay where the man you've gone. But I say I want a big no storm this time on my man, he is not. Just Breathe by Robert Honor, and before that we had Pedal Blues by Big Nose Thomas. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to be joined now by Twanglin' Jack Ford over in the Ilk Shed for this week's album review. Cornology. 
the complete Bonzo Dog Doodah band. There was possibly no other act more representative of the look, the sound, the humour and the exuberance of the second half of the 1960s than the Bonzo Dog Doodah band. In the mid-60s, during a family visit to Madame Tussaud, the tourist trail took us through an exhibition of modern art. As a 10-year-old, I was really taken by the giant Liechtenstein painting of a fighter plane, but the overall aesthetic I took away was of the crude automata with tennis ball eyes and chattering false teeth. This was the look of the bonzos. One of them, Roger Ruskin's spear, created Heath Robinson-style impractical machines. The Bonzos were the darling of the mid-60s pop art explosion. Minis and miniskirts, Militaria and mind expanding. Granny takes a trip and I was Lord Kitchener's valet. I first saw the Bonzo Dog Doodah band doing their crazy mix of comedy, trad jazz and pop rock on a remarkable Tea Time Kids TV show called Do Not Adjust Your Set, which also featured David Jason and three comedians who went on to be part of Monty Python's Flying Circus. The Bonzo's standout performance for me was probably their version of Monster Mash. They had a radio hit with the intro and the outro, a track puzzlingly complex at the time. Now it could probably just be made with a loop pedal, but at the time you had to admire the sheer effort that went into just one musical joke. In it we hear each of the band being introduced in a typical way, but it doesn't stop there. Anyone of my vintage will remember some of the other mentions, though naming them all would be like naming all the faces on the Sgt Pepper cover. The ones I remember are Eric Clapton on ukulele, General de Gaulle on accordion, Quasimodo on bells, and the Count Basie Orchestra on triangle. Their most famous album was the euphemistically titled Donut in Granny's Greenhouse. They had a big hit single with Urban Spaceman and a famous B-side with Canyons of Your Mind. There was also social comment with songs like My Pink Half of the Drainpipe. There was surreal nonsense like Do the Trouser Press and strangely poetic amusing monologues like Big Shot that ended with the line Have you got a light, Mac? No, but I've got a dark brown overcoat. The front men were Vivian Stansell, who spoke and sang with an announcer's sense of serious authority, the plummy received pronunciation making the weirdness stand out even more, and Neil Innes, who later went on to work with the Pythons and the Ruttles. Neil Innes is also famous for the saying, I have suffered for my art, and now it's your turn. They were psychedelic, but not in the hippie, trippy, Grateful Dead, Hate Asby way, but in the visually playful, mock Edwardian, Union, Jack Carnaby Street, Great British way, the Peter Blake, Sergeant Pepper cover, Eggman and Walrus way. They appeared in the Beatles' Magical Mystery Tour TV special, performing their song Death Cab for Cutie. Their final album was recorded as a contractual obligation, and has a number of fairly accurate but rather obvious parodies. A Beach Boys parody about dandruff called King of Scurf. A Rocky number about constipation called Do the Strain. And a Johnny Cash type number. A couple of times Neil Innes does Beatles type things, which is probably a precursor to his work on the Ruttles' All You Need Is Cash. Viv Stanchel does a piece about Sir Henry at Rawlingson End, a comic spoken piece where the comedy was all in the inventive choice of words, a piece that became a series broadcast on the John Peel show. Stanchel is probably most famous for being the voice of tubular bells. The final track on the final album is impossible not to laugh at, yet it somehow seems like cheating. After years of trying everything to be funny, sometimes succeeding and sometimes not, it all ends with a badly edited tape loop of a laugh. Cornology, the complete Bonzo Dog Doodah band. 
Big thank you to Twanglin Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Big Nose Thomas for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can email me here at the studio by dropping me a line on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anyone with MP3s, a story to share, etc. Don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we're repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on iTunes, Spotify and the Wickham Sound Listen Again. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune for this week. This is Pauline Valance with It Is What It Is. I'll see you next week. Welcome to my 
my company a penny for you too. I stuck a lolly up my nose and almost pierced the brain. Come back, Paddy Casters. Come back, Bronco Shirt and here it comes again. Oh, look, and here comes Red Parry plus Tap Hunter, and that makes three. Ah, oh, blah, blah.